are we going to transform the country? So the first thing to do in terms of transforming the Conservative Party is get rid of all the old aristocratic paternalists. Get rid of all the men who had bought in to the corporate welfare state. Get rid of the men who were prepared to um, uh, 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 go along with the so-called social democratic consensus. Okay? These are the people that she described as wets. Okay? Um, and uh, what she does in puts in place instead is this radical creed of economic liberalisation. Okay? Remember that the Conservative Party had been the party in the 19th century that was fiercely critical of the free market and of industrialization because it, they thought it loosened the bonds of social cohesion and sort of an organic com community in which aristocratic people were naturally at the head of society. Here you have a conservative prime minister saying, no, we must have ruthless economic liberalization and pushing forward with um, a, a belief in individualism, not in social harmony or cohesion. Okay, she very famously said in the 1980s, there's no such thing as society, there's only individuals and families. And I'll come back to that statement yesterday. Okay, so on the one hand, you've got this new creed of economic liberalisation. On the other, she throws some bones to the Conservative Party, the, the Conservative Party that was, because in many ways she's an authoritarian, a moralist authoritarian, as we're going to see pioneers this belief of returning back to Victorian values in which the family and hard work and thrift was um, supposedly valorised and probably most importantly of all she wraps herself up in the Union Jack and, 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 and engages in some fiercely nationalist politics not least the invasion of that critically strategic part of the British Empire, the Falkland Islands um, in 1983 and in her endless um, critique of the project of European integration, which Britain, she was determined, would remain um, a, a, aloof from. A very similar thing happens in the Labour Party. Okay? There's a, this, um, a, a, the Labour Party, as a consequence of these successive defeats, um, is goes on a long journey of soul-searching and reform rather like it had in the 1950s. It began under the leader Neil Kinnock um, uh, in 1983. He gets rid of the red flag of the Labour Party, replaces it with the lovely red rose um, that you see behind me. He abandons the um, commitment to unilateral um, nuclear disarmament um, that had been in place in the Labour Party manifestos, and he um, uh, 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 also backs away from the repeal of the Labour laws that we're going to see that Mrs. Thatcher um, uh, introduces in the early 90s. Um, uh, his successor, um, oh, I haven't got time to go into this, it will just take me too long. Anyway, the point, the, uh, the point that I'm trying to make is, is a succession of leaders reform different elements of the Labour Party okay? Try, and tries to bring it more in line and it culminates with the election of Tony Blair in 1995 and his commitment to building what he called a new Labour Party the centrepiece of which was the repeal of Clause 4 okay? Clause 4 in the Labour Party constitution written by the Webbs in 1918 had made a commitment to the, um, taking the commanding heights of the economy into public ownership. So in 1995, the Labour Party abandons its commitment to uh, nationalised industries and renationalising the industries that Thatcher had um, uh, privatised. <coughs> Arguably at the core of um, Blair's project was an attempt to try and find a third, w a third way between old style um, uh, 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 Labour Party socialism as he saw it and uh, Thatcherite neoliberal uh, free market um, policies. And the way in which he does that is to, by arguing contrast to Thatcher that social cohesion, the unity of society was actually 
critical for making the market work more effectively. Okay? It unleashed social cohesion, unleashed the creativity of individuals, enabled them to be entrepreneurs and to develop wealth um, and to develop uh, prosperity. And so one of the things that the Labour Party does is slowly back away from the old pledges to equality that was replaced with equality of opportunity and began increasingly to talk much more simply of social justice. That is to say, well, we'll deal with um, the <laughs> issues of poverty and child poverty especially by being, providing generous forms of, um, uh, of, of public provision. Um, but we're still going to believe in a basic market system as a way of trying to sort out the wheat from the chaff, to try and see who it is um, uh, uh, has the uh, potential to become um, uh, dynamic and wealthy individuals. And at the heart of that agenda then became Blair's idea of trying to modernise public services, modernise the welfare state, by which he meant basically su um, subject it to the types of market pressures and reforms that Mrs. Thatcher had begun to develop um, but hadn't fully um, unleashed. So in many ways, Blair pushes forward the, the marketization of public services that the um, at Thatcher administration um, began to, um, <coughs> to lay out. This was what he called his choice agenda that citizens should be able to have a choice about the type of ways in which they educate their children, the ways in which they seek health care, etc., um, etc. So in this new labor logic, the citizen had to try and calculate their decisions as though they were in business. They had to try and calculate um, what types of public services they would want to use, what were the costs and benefits, what were the ways in which um, they um, could calculate and compute which public services were the best for them. Rather than in the old style, the state saying, look, we're providing universal provision, you don't get a choice, this is your hospital, but if you go to that hospital, you're going to get equally good care than if you went to hospital A, B or C. Okay. Let's, this is going to be by far the bulk of the lecture. Does anyone have any questions about um, the rise of the new right and of new labour? One of the glorious things about Mrs. Thatcher is that she actually came up with fantastic, um, uh, uh, fantastic quotes. Um, and um, uh, this is one of my favourite. Economics are the method, but the object is to change the heart and the soul. Okay? Um, now, here we see, I think, a real parallel with 19th century liberalism. Okay. Remember that so much of 19th century liberalism was trying to create that new ideal liberal person. Yeah? And in many ways, what Mrs. Thatcher was trying to do was to do precisely the same thing. To try and create a new type of person who was no longer dependent no, who, uh, upon the old forms of welfare capitalism. A new type of person who was able, basically, to govern themselves without the support of the state. Um, and in her b belief, it was by the liberalization of the economy and the creation, the return to the free market that she thought had historically always operated um, uh, in Britain before um, the arrival of social democracy. What this would do would unleash um, the uh, uh, entrepreneurial potential of individuals. It would um, show that individuals actually thrived without state support, without state provision. And as we know, because we saw this developing 
in the um, uh, uh, 1970s. Um, one of the key ways in which this um, uh, creed was justified was by promising to reverse the so-called decline of Britain. Okay? So in the Thatcher um, uh, 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 in, the, in the Thatcher's Conservative Party, Britain's so-called decline, um, uh, 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 it's, uh, the retreat of its global status and of its, uh, of its economy, was a product of social democracy. Welfare capitalism had led Britain down a blind alley. Returning to the free market was going to enable Britain to become great again, <coughs> would enable Britain to become you know, a leading player on the world um, stage. And here we have a very important thing to say, which is that this was conceived quite clearly as Thatcher trying to set Britain apart from the rest of Europe. Okay? The rest of the European economy and European nations were really locked into a sort of corporate style of welfare capitalism. Okay? What Thatcher wanted to do was to create a little neoliberal island off the coast of Europe that would attract foreign investment and foreign um, forms um, uh, 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 of um, production um, plants. New, com new companies, new foreign companies arriving into Britain attracted by its newly liberalised uh, economy. And so there are four key ways in which this is achieved. Okay? Through privatisation, through the deregulation of the labour market, through taxation policy, and through uh, the reduction uh, of, or the, or the redirection of public expenditure. And I'm going to talk about each of those in turn. Okay? Privatisation, deregulation of the labour market, taxation policy, and the redirection of um, public expenditure. So first, privatisation. Um, Really, one of the centerpieces of the Thatcher administration was to get rid of nationalised industries. Nationalised industries, which she thought was a sort of drain on the state and which uh, uh, were um, uh, incapable of generating sufficient uh, uh, w uh, wealth. And so there's a whole series of privatisations that occur <coughs> that I'm going to read out to you very quickly. The very first things to go was um, uh, uh, that uh, well-known ecologically sound company, uh, British Petroleum, um, in 1979, um, uh, uh, public housing, um, uh, the right to buy your own um, uh, council house in 1979, British Aerospace in 1980, um, uh, uh, British Telecom and British Airways in 1986. Rolls-Royce in 1987, British Leyland, oh, 1988, um, uh, uh, British Steel, 1988, Water, 1989, Gas, 1990, Electricity, Coal and Rail in 1994. Big, big, I mean basically everything that had been taken into public ownership in the 1940s and 1950s now returned to um, the... Um, uh, to, the, um, uh, to the market. Now, one of the central justifications of this was to give these companies back to the people. Okay? This was part of the rhetoric. What we're going to do is not just privatise these companies, what we're going to do is to democratise capital. We're going to make every Briton a shareholder. But, unlike in the US, shareholding, i.e., popular participation in financial markets in Britain was remarkably narrow in scope. Um, and so you can see that in... 19, I'm so worried about moving away from this. In 1979, um, only just over 2% um, 